Andrew Carnegie, who was the, the wealthiest man in the, in the world at that time, decided to uh, give back and give his money away. Self-educated, and he thought that that was the way to people to make their fortune and to um, better themselves were to have uh, libraries. Carnegie had a architect design what he thought that the libraries should look like. He felt that they were seats of learning and that it should be kind of majestic looking. The land that the uh, library was on was a park and people uh, are familiar with Peterson Park in Mattoon, but this was also called Peterson Park and on the um, Van Buren Street or the uh, north side was an arch going over a uh, sidewalk that said Peterson Park and um, this the property was purchased uh, for a dollar from the Peterson uh, family and uh, the uh, library was built there. It was done, it started in around 1902 and it uh, was finished in an, and the opening in all official was done January of 1904. They tried to bring in uh, local flares from, for instance, Paul Sargent, who was a local artist, and after his death, um, the uh, library uh, bought uh, two of his uh, paintings. They hang in the Carnegie Room on either end above the fireplaces, so uh, the early 1960s, 62 and 64, uh, two additions were built on the south side and the north side. This is uh, Booth. Uh, from uh, the Booth Library at Eastern. Uh, when she passed away, uh, she made a, a, a memorial donation and the children's area was all totally furnished by the uh, memorial that she left. It stayed up until uh, we did the uh, rebuilding and adding on the large addition that is there now. We wanted to have it look and fit in with the original Carnegie uh, building and uh, I, think, I think it does that very well. Children have the schools in their own in libraries in the schools, which is great. And adults uh, after graduation do no, no longer have access to uh, the schools and so forth. So this is a, a learning place for adults to, to come. And um, the legacy of, uh, I think, has really lived on in Charleston. My story is about the Academy of Lifelong Learning, which is a group sponsored by the School of Continuing Ed at Eastern. And we're a group of folks that um, enjoys learning through experience. We try to offer a broad range of courses and events um, to adults of any age that just simply want to get out and learn something new in a relaxed environment, have some fun, and talk about it. The Academy recently took a trip to a local daylily farm. It was amazing. I mean, it was just drop-dead gorgeous, first of all, but the educational component was outstanding. Another thing that has become rather popular is first-person portrayals. We had Amelia Earhart come and talk to us. Um, that was out at the Coles County Airport. Another event that was really fun, we had um, old time radio theater and we met at an old restaurant um, in Oilfield, Illinois, um, that used to be a schoolhouse, um, very, very rich in history. And this group presented radio as it would have been years ago. One of the fun things about um, the participating in the academy is that you get to talk to other people um, about your experience. And that's another thing adult learners like to do. We want to be engaged in it. We want to talk about our perspective. We want to talk about what, what we've experienced and what we've learned. We like to listen to other people um, and, then, and then push it forward. Um, we all know that um, our brains drive everything that we do and that brain health is really critical for um, aging well. And 
a lot of what we're doing here applies to boomers. You know, we want to live it. And, and that's really, I think, in a way, what the Academy is, is offering. Well, it's the oldest and continuous uh, non-governmental organization in Coles County. Well, originally, um, they met in the courthouse uh, early on. I guess church and state separation weren't what they are today. And they built, um, their first building was there by the town branch. It was actually across from where the, where the, the county sheriff's station is. And that was in 1842. Uh, and the congregation relocated to where it is now and built a building there at that corner in 1856. And uh, they'd outgrown the building that was on that site and they removed it. And I think it's also the reason they outgrew it was in part the arrival of the university in 1895. And Livingston Lord was a member of First Presbyterian Church and sort of the folklore of the congregation is he expected most of the faculty to attend there. And uh, if you look at the building, it's made out of the same Indiana limestone as Pemberton and Blair and um, looks vaguely familiar like some of those early Eastern buildings. And it has all these features in it uh, that are for the beginning of the 20th century kind of interesting. There's a crank that you can use that pulls up a whole wall, a solid wall in the, up into the attic. Uh, it had gas lights. It's built on a horizontal plane. And part of that is in the Presbyterian tradition in particular, the emphasis is on the, the hearing of the word and being gathered around the word. So the pew, there's only maybe six or eight rows of pews, and they're all sort of shaped around a central pulpit. So we've been in existence for almost 200 years now, and we, it's only had 14 pastors. One that stands out among them is um, Reverend Blair, William Blair, and he was a New Zealander. Uh, and he came here at the wrong moment. He came in 1930 and he didn't leave till 1958. And he um, kept racehorses and, uh, at the county fairgrounds. He rode a motorcycle. He was an amateur boxer and held boxing matches in the basement of the church. <laughs> it was fairly progressive. When the Presbyterian Church um, General Assembly approved the ordination of women as elders and deacons in the church in 19, 30, uh, the next year, this congregation started electing women as church officers. The history of the Presbyterian Church is really intertwined with the 19th and 20th century history of Charleston. There are a lot of ways in which the, the congregation's life and the issues and things that are going on in it are uh, very much shaped by things going on in Charleston, and in some cases shaped things in Charleston, I think. I'm passionate about one-room schools, but I guess because of the history behind them and the romantic aura, which probably was not true, because the teacher was the janitor, the counselor. She was, she or he had to furnish the textbooks, and for that they were paid, probably not in hard cash money, probably in eggs and wood. The teachers could teach after high school, a lot of them. They graduated from high school and with a no accreditation could just start teaching. That meant that probably they had some students who were just a few years younger than they were. But a few went to uh, Westfield College, which existed in Westfield, Illinois, and it was a big accreditation agency until EIU came along and kind of stole its thunder. <laughs> in um, Coles County, there were 132 schools in Coles County, and they were um, about four to six miles apart, and they wanted to keep them where the population was. 
and uh, the school was really a community center. In um, 1854, the, they passed a law, finally, putting some teeth behind the funding for public schools. They established the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. And in the graph, you can see that there was a big spike in school building then. The Greenwood School on campus was one of the schools that was built during that spiking. In 1949, the school district started consolidating, and that was the beginning of the end for the one-room schools. I think it's fascinating that in the whole state of Illinois, with over 10,000 one-room schools, the little old Charleston was the first one to consolidate. That's therefore community school district number one. We were the first. <laughs> Charleston really is sort of the beginning and the end um, of, of Lincoln's story here in Illinois. Um, the Lincoln family uh, migrated to Illinois in 1830 uh, and crossed the, uh, the Ambra River just south of town. Uh, and then uh, in, in 1861, Lincoln comes back to Charleston for his last visit, which is to um, make arrangements for the care of his stepmother. Uh, and so, you know, between those years, I, we, we've got the story of Abraham Lincoln and his family here in Charleston and Coles County. Abraham's cousins, uh, Dennis Hanks and Squire Hall, married to his sisters, uh, his, his stepsisters, which are Elizabeth Johnston and Matilda Johnston. And so you've got this blended family um, that lives here in Coles County and lives in Charleston. Uh, and when Lincoln comes um, in the intervening years, uh, he's coming for a couple of reasons. One is to practice law here in Charleston, uh, but also um, he takes the opportunity to come and visit his family that lives here. Uh, just south of town, uh, is the farm of, of uh, Thomas and Sarah Lincoln, Abraham's father and stepmother. Uh, and when he comes to town, uh, he would often go out to visit uh, with his family out there as well. And after uh, 1841, Lincoln also owned uh, a portion of the farm down there in, in, in uh, Pleasant Grove Township. Uh, he purchased 40 acres of his father's farm, and he did that to ensure that um, Thomas and Sarah Lincoln would be cared for in their old age. His uh, last visit was in January of 1861. Uh, Abraham Lincoln has now been elected president of the United States um, and his father has been dead now for 10 years however his beloved stepmother is still living here in in Coles County uh, and so when they come in January of 1861 um, his his primary uh, reason for coming is to really make arrangements for the care of Sarah while he's gone to Washington uh, in his absence um, he wants to ensure that she's well cared for uh, and so they go down to uh, um, Pleasant Grove Township and uh, he gets to visit the farm, gets to visit his father's grave, um, and then he brings Sarah Lincoln back to Charleston and uh, she stays with a granddaughter here in Charleston. Uh, and so in uh, 1865 she's back down on the farm again living with her grandson John Hall uh, when news comes that Abraham has been assassinated. You know, here in Illinois, we have the Lincoln story that, uh, that covers um, most of the state. Uh, we're part of the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area, which is 42 counties here in Illinois. And uh, although Abraham never lived here, he had uh, close, close ties to Charleston throughout his life, uh, both with his family, um, with his legal career, uh, and then also his political career. All of these things combined to bring Charleston um, uh, and, and Abraham Lincoln together. My parents came here in 1966 and I was born in 1967 at Mississippi State University where my dad got his doctorate in aerospace engineering. So when Eastern approached my father for a position here, dad decided that this was where he wanted to be. He came up the hill of Highway 16 and he saw the castle and he was in love. He felt like he was King Arthur, and so he chose to want to be here. And so we lived here um, most of my life. And so for my parents, they would incorporate all sorts of um, Indian cultural things 
but then we do all the American stuff too. And I didn't realize how different that was until we would go up to Chicago and meet the people there. Because we celebrated Christmas, we celebrated Halloween, we did the Easter egg hunt. If somebody invited us to their church, we were willing to go if they wanted us to talk about our culture anywhere. You know, the Rotary Club, wherever they were asked to go, we did. So it wasn't a big deal. And I went through from preschool fourth in this very building. I went to kindergarten four, kindergarten five, and then when they stopped, first grade is when they finished, and then I had to go to public school. And I went to Carl Sandburg. And so we did the Halloween parades. We were able to do the, uh, gosh, they used to do all the ice cream social. My parents were part of the PTA. My mother would volunteer in the library. And she'd wear her Indian's clothing all the time. I think with growing up here in my two years of Charleston High School, I think that really gave me the freedom to be who I was. So I'd always wear bracelets. So that was like the big thing of who I was known for. I was always wearing my Indian clothes and it was like really promoted me to be myself. Even though they didn't understand some of the things I did, they still appreciated the fact that I had the courage and be myself and express myself. So my parents were very patient with this community and they were very kind. My aunt had her wedding, which was in 1971. So they had this huge wedding. It was one of the first Indian weddings in our Indian cultural history. And so, and it was a Bengali wedding. So my mom and dad are from Calcutta, India. And so it's a big, huge, out of this world kind of wedding. And they did it in the garage at 717 Olean Place in Charleston, Illinois. And so we invited everybody in the neighborhood to come and witness this kind of wedding. My class reunion is at the end of this month. And so, you know, we're all sharing all these pictures and these stories, and I, I look at all the pictures and I go, they, they were such a close clan. The idea that they welcomed me in even after being gone for so long was, was just a very, very kind. Every time we left, my, we came back and my friends were at the door. I never thought that people could not accept me the way I was and the way I still am. <laughs>Coles County Arts Council started in a little room in the back of the Charleston City Hall with a chair, a desk, and a four-drawer file cabinet. <laughs> and a handful of volunteers, many of whom are still with us, who decided that it was time to, uh, to have an Arts Council. We were incorporated as a nonprofit group in 1984, and Pat Mailer was our very first president. In 1985, Milburn Smith started City Art, a display of local area artists, and it was held in the lobby at the City Hall building. And it was so popular that a number of years later, in 2010, we started City Art 2, which is all young people's art up on the second floor. In 1986 to 88, we contracted with the local, with the square merchants, and held arts in the square. Uh, it was uh, evenings of uh, days of, of music, of dance, of food, <laughs> an art exhibition, a quilt exhibition. And see, it was at these outdoor festivals that our very first annual all-ages art activity occurred, and that was the Great Charleston Chalk-In. And now you know it as the Fourth of July Chalk-In because we moved in 1990 to the Red, White, and Blue Days, where it's been a regular activity. In 1991, we started Kids Arts in the Park, and that is very popular. The children love it. It's a morning of a smorgasbord of all sorts of hands-on arts activities that kids can enjoy. In 94, we saw a lot of changes. We added our next regular art activity, and that was Artist Day in the Garden. It started out as just an idea by Jackie Warden for a quick little fundraiser so people could go out and enjoy West Whiteside's garden east of town. And now it's been going every year since then. One of the activities we do annually that's from, started from the very beginning is what we call Prelude. Prelude is the beginning of our year, our beginning of our activity year with 
with a, a big banquet where we host all our membership and our friends in the arts. And its whole point is to celebrate what we've been doing for the past year, to give a little bit of a report about what we've been doing and what our plans are for the future. Um, we're looking forward to future years with more, more readings, more workshops, more children's activities, and more opportunities to share and promote the arts with everyone in our county. We have had such a fantastic evening here tonight with our storytellers, with community members, and with you, the viewer from home, calling in tonight. Now, you have some thank yous, right? Sure, I do. I have Jeff, Ethan, and Suzanne Bennett from Booth Library. Thank you there so you go. much. And Lou Hinkin, who did the story on uh, past president. Right. Lou Hinkin, thank you, Lou and Mary Kay. We really appreciate it. The, we want to give you a thank you as That's well. Right. So if you haven't called tonight, this mm -hmm. is your last chance to talk to one of us tonight live in the WEIU TV studio. Mm -hmm. I'm running out of breath. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I am going to get energized when those phones start ringing, but you have to give a call right now. I'm serious. Seven. The time is running out. Seven. There's seven phone lines right now that are not busy. We need you to go to the phone right now. Who's going to be number one? Who's gonna be no? Oh, we've got Kathy on the phone over here. <laughs> there you go. Who's gonna be the? Who's gonna be number two? We need people to call right now. This is the last part of our program right here. We need you to call. If you haven't called all night, now's your time. You know what? We've offered this opportunity to a couple of other towns before mm -hmm. Charleston. Tonight is going to be the mm -hmm. night, and we said this to start mm -hmm. out. It's going to go down in history Thank because you. we have gotten more calls at the end of the show mm -hmm. on other two <laughs> programs than we ever mm -hmm. have before throughout any of the breaks. So, Charleston, it's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you tonight to make all these phones ring, and we're counting on you right now because we need to see your power, your support, your dollars come in here and here to say thank you mm -hmm. to WEIU Charleston, your storytellers. I tell you what, these phones need to ring. You'd want to tell these people in here how important this was because you're learning about the history. You're gonna be able to share this. And I'll tell you what, we had our production manager share with Lori and I. She says to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been. And that's exactly what all of this is about tonight. It's all about Charleston. Support them tonight, support us, and support your community. Jana, over to you. Well said, Ken. Uh, tonight, I know that if you're out there and you've been watching, you've enjoyed this program. Uh, how could you not enjoy a program about your hometown? And so those of you that have called, we really appreciate you. But if you haven't called, please call right now. It's time to support a television station that cares about your community. We care about you. So we need you to get on the phone right now. We have got a couple calls, but there's still a couple phone lines that have not been lit up yet. Let's light them up. Let's end this night with a good, good fight, okay? We are right now at 108. You know, if we could get to like 115 or 120, we will surpass our other two programs. I tell you what, I'm shooting for 150 <laughs> because I know the people out there have it in hey. them. And I'm not going out weak here. We're going out strong. We're going to light it up tonight in the studio. We've got so many mm -hmm. storytellers still in here with us. Mm -hmm. We've got Jane Gilbert, Robert Inyart, Tina Whining, Sujata, Sujata, Ginger Stanfield, Jeff Boshar, all the people you see behind us. That's because this is important mm -hmm. to them. Community is important. Charleston is important. We need to go out strong tonight. So give us a call mm -hmm. if you want to talk to anyone else in the studio tonight we'll get them on the phones for you they're sitting over there I'm not lying there they <laughs> there are right they are. there they're in our living room studio right now <laughs> $75 gift one copy of the program tonight mm -hmm. 120 two copies also for 120 you can get the book around the square as well as a copy of the program but the only way you're going to do it is by calling right now this is your last mm -hmm. opportunity tonight to give us a call and talk to one of our storytellers. Someone just called, but we have four phones that are open. So right now, give Mark a call, give Sharon a call. Kathy, oh, we have more than that. We have Lindsay, so here we go. Let's get it going, let's get a phone blitz. We do not want to end this night. If you've been waiting to call, we don't want to, we don't want to um, have you go away and not Empty handed. Your, yeah, thank you don't want to go saying. home and <laughs> you don't want to go away empty handed. That's what you want to say. And we don't want you to go either because this is something very special. If you're thinking about 
maybe an inter anniversary gift, a birthday gift, mm -hmm. um, you name it, whatever it is, something to just say thank you. Thanksgiving is coming up. We're very thankful to be a part of this program. And if you want to say thanks, give us a call right now because that's a way to say thank you to your community for being a part of it. And right now, this is all about home. I want you to feel like you're home tonight. We've got three minutes. Let's get these phones ringing right now. We don't want to hear silence in here. We know you've got it in you, so give us a call right now. As we've talked earlier tonight, if WEIU would not have done this program, who else is going to do it? And I think the answer we all know is there's not one, anyone else that would do a program on Charleston, on our hometown. We are right here in the backyard of Charleston. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we do a program on Charleston? Right. So if you're out there tonight and you value this kind of programming, I'm telling you, it's money well spent. You're going to give a gift to us, and we're going to turn around and give a gift to you. And why? Because we cherish Charleston. Mm -hmm. We know it's important. So if it's important to you, call, please call right now. And it's not only important to us, it's important to the people mm -hmm. in this studio, the people who have, there's some more thank yous, oh, the thank you. people who have taken part in this program right now, they are sharing the history of Charleston, local history that, you know what, our kids don't get enough of, and that's because <laughs> there's not enough stories being shared, mm -hmm. and it's because of programs mm -hmm. like this that we're able to do that. Well, like we talked the other night after our premiere, several teachers that were in the audience said, we want to incorporate this into our classroom. Mm -hmm. So we are preserving local history that may have otherwise not been used. Yeah, that's right. And you know what? Kathy Hummel was a school teacher. I had another post on um, social media tonight. <laughs> there, there was a student who sent a picture of being in her elementary class. She's tuning in from Michigan tonight mm -hmm. watching this, and I tell you what, it's very mm -hmm. special. And she's still about education and about mm -hmm. schools, and she told about the one-room schoolhouses tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm laughing because Mr. Inyard's going under a camera, so there's there's one of our storytellers right there. Okay, thank some shout-outs. Jane Bardsley, thank you so much. She's been a part of the community for a long time. Ann Winkler Henricks, thank you. She's calling from Collinsville. Thank you so much. Judy Justice from Ashmore. It is amazing how many people from out of town and out of state have called. Most of them are probably longtime Charleston residents that have retired there or whatever. But how great is that? It's awesome. We've been so blessed to be a part of this program tonight, to be a part of Charleston, calling it home. And this is your opportunity right now to call it home as well. Share it with your folks, your family. I tell you what, you have to call right now. This is your last opportunity. We've only got about two minutes left with you right now. Call in with your mm -hmm. gift of $75. Get a copy of that. 100 for two copies. You can get um, the book and the DVD for 120 as well. It's not that much to ask. We'll work mm -hmm. with you however you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Jane is our membership manager. We love it when you become a member of WEIU. And the nice thing about becoming a member of WEIU, when you call, you're going to talk to me. You're not going to talk to an answering machine. You're not going to get you know, sent around all these different people. You're going to talk to me, and I do care about you. And I want to um, let you know that we here at WEIU, we appreciate our viewers, we appreciate our donors, and we do everything we can to keep that friendship going. All right, so this is it. We're calling it quits for tonight, but I'll tell you what, the phones are still mm -hmm. open. We're going to be in here in the studio cleaning up and putting things <laughs> away and cheering everybody oh. on. Charleston, you've come home tonight. Yeah. It's been a blessing working Woo! with you. To keep those phones calling, go online. Charleston, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Judy Garrow and Linda Goble. Thank you so much.